okay thank you all right <clears throat> good morning welcome back any questions before we start the assignment is due on friday somebody said uh, somebody was wondering if it's today it's due on friday okay all right so let's get uh, started with uh, well we, we i want to uh, conclude our discussion on pca or principal component analysis today and then we are going to move into another topic which is connected to pca so not much of a shift all right uh, so let's uh, so uh, if you remember last class we were talking about um, a technique called principal component analysis with the main motivation being if you have data in d dimensional space but you want to represent it in a smaller space, L-dimensional space, how do you do that, right? And when we talk about this, right, uh, so forget about PCA altogether. If I ask you to change the dimensionality, right, of, uh, or, or if I want to project data into a new space, right, so mathematically, what does it mean, right? So if you think of, uh, let's say, let's think of a three-dimensional or two-dimensional space, right, Right, so let's think of, uh, let's assume that we have data in a two-dimensional space, a 2D example. This is kind of what we did in last class, right? So if, if you have some data objects or data points lying in this two-dimensional space, so what does this mean method or geometrically, right? So when we talk about a space, a coordinate space, a coordinate space is determined by uh, what we call basis vectors, right? A co if, if I talk about a, a coordinate space or a Cartesian, well, a coordinate space, right? Then it, there are some basis vectors that, that represent the space, okay? If it is an orthogonal coordinate space, then these basis vectors will be perpendicular to each other. So, for example, whenever we, whenever we talk about a two-dimensional space, this and this, these are two basis vectors that determine this space, right? And they are perpendicular to each other, which means that any point here, any object can be represented as a linear combination of these two basis vectors, right? So, for example, this basis vector could be represented as uh, 1 comma 0, right? Because if you draw a line from origin through 1 comma 0, that vector will be this and this basis vector can be represented as a 0 comma 1, right? So now if I want to represent any object here, you can just take a linear combination of this and this and you get the new object, right? So now if I ask you to give me a new coordinate space, let's say I want you to give me a new two-dimensional coordinate space, then what you want, you, you would have to do is, you would have to give me two vectors. So so let's say I want a new dimensional space in which one of the axes is like this. So this is the first basis vector. Of course, the second basis vector, since this is an orthogonal space, is already determined. It will be like this, right? So essentially, when you do this transformation, you will have to come up with a, a two vectors, w, uh, well, uh, w1 and w2, some value here and some value here. This will correspond to this, this will correspond to this, right? So these will be expressed in the form, in the original basis vectors. So, so essentially this, uh, if we put it together, these two vectors, then this becomes a matrix W. So this is the matrix which helps you convert data in the original space into a new space, right? And the, the features of this matrix is that each column is a unit vector because it is a basis vector, right? And so, which means that it is, it has a, uh, when we said unit vector, that means its norm is unit, which means that this square plus this square is one. And the, these two vectors need to be perpendicular to each other, which means that if you take their dot product, it will be zero, right? So that's the notion. So now let us try to expand, extend this notion. So here, all we did was that we rotated the space. So the effect of this W is that now, if, if let's say this is a point X, right? So if I do W X, what is happening is that we get a new point, right? So this is a two by two, this is two by one. So we get a two by one point Z, which is the same point X in this new space, right? So this is the effect of this uh, multiplication. 
now we can extend it. So let's say we have three dimensional space and I want to convert the data into a two dimensional space. So then I would need two basis vectors because my new space has two dimensions, right? And these two basis vectors need to be expressed in terms of the original three basis vector. So if we go from R3 to R2, we need uh, two basis vectors that will help us determine our data points. And these basis vectors, each of these will be a three element vector because you need to express this new basis vector in terms of your original three, right? So, so your W matrix will be three by two, right? So this is the first basis vector, second basis vector, third basis vector, right? And then what you do is you get your data and you multiply with x. So uh, the x will be in three dimensional space when you multiply it with, uh, uh, <clears throat> did I do it wrong? Right, so when you then you get a new data point, right? So now you can come up with any basis vectors, right? So for example, even in this case, right, you could have come up with these two basis vectors. You could have come up with another one like this, another one like this. So there is there are infinite possibilities. Now, which one is the best basis vector to represent this data, right? So what the PCA theorem says is that if you come up with uh, any basis vector and you project your data in this new space and then try to recover the original data back, the error that you get between your original and the recovered data will be minimum if you use the eigenvectors as your uh, basis vectors. All right, so that is essentially just the gist of the classical PCA theorem. It says that if you want to go from d dimensional space to l dimensional space there are infinite ways you can come up with those basis vectors to do the transformation but the best transformation is given by the principal components which are the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix right so best transformation is given by pca now, when, I, when we say best, it means that you are computing the, the squared norm of the error, right? So, in that term, the, it is the best. But if you have another measure, then it might not be the best. All right? So, that is just the gist of it. All right. Any questions so far? Okay. So, now let us look at what is sort of... So, we, we did look at some of the uh, demonstration of PCA. And now I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, how PCA is used for analyzing faces, all right? So let's go to this uh, workbook. We, we looked at all of this. We looked at all of this, right? We have this beautiful picture. All right, here it is. All right, so we are going to work with a publicly available data set. It's called Yale Faces. It is just a collection of a lot of faces, all right? So uh, let's start from here. So this is the data, uh, and the data is there on the GitHub thing as well. So what we do is here in this part, I'm just loading all of the data, right? The data has a lot of aspects to it. So uh, it's grouped into different types of uh, images, face images. They're all faces. Let me make it a little bigger. You know what this... Uh, This huge image is causing a problem. I'm going to just all right, yeah. All right, so I load the data here. You see that this data has a lot of types of faces. So faces in which the light is falling in the center, faces with glass wearing glasses, happy left light. Uh, so all right, no glasses and all of these things. So th this is used for many. If you are interested in doing image analysis, this is a nice data set to use uh, for benchmarking. But anyway, see here we are loading all of the data, okay? Then I am just displaying some of these data sets, uh, some of these faces. So, so we can see uh, there are different types of faces. So what they do is they take one person and they take 
that person's photograph in different settings. So put a glass on it, shine light from different areas, happy, sad, and all of these things, and then so on, right? <clears throat> okay, so for us, each data object is a face, okay? So we do the same thing as we did for digits. We vectorize it, which means that even though this face is looks like a two-dimensional matrix, we are going to flatten it, right? So we have a whole data set, which looks like this. Then what I do is I uh, convert it into two parts. I'm going to take some training data to do my sub, uh, PCA, and then I'm going to test it on rest of the data, all right? So uh, one thing you can do is just look at the mean face. So if I take the mean of all the faces and, you know, basically I just put them all top of each other and then take a mean, this is what it looks like. So the reason I'm doing that is that if you remember from last class, in PCA we assume that all of your data is mean centered, which means that every column has a zero mean, right? So we take this mean face and then we center our data. That's a normal practice. So then all the images change a little bit because you are subtracting the mean out of it but you still see the original image there, right? Then the next thing we want to do is do PCA because we want to represent this data. Now this data by itself uh, is in, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, sorry. All right, all right. Here it is. So I load the data, I display it, then I uh, split it into two parts, I do the mean face thing, then I center it, and then I look at all these, some of these images just randomly. Then I want to, so each image here, right? So if I look at the shape of this data set, has these many dimensions, all right? So what we did was we took all these pixels and flattened them into a big array, right? So this is the D, capital D of this data set, right? Pretty large. And now we want to see can we reduce the dimensionality without losing too much information, right? So we do PCA. Here I'm using the sklearn package for PCA, but if you want, you can do your own. For example, you just take the, the covariance matrix for this data set and then you do eigenvector analysis take the eigenvector that has the highest eigenvalue, right? So you could do that. The first thing, as I said last time, was we look at the scree plot or the knee plot, sometimes they call it. So which is essentially the, which tells you how much variance is being explained by top few eigenvectors or top few principal components. So what this tells you is that the first principal component explains 30% of the variance. So if you took only, if you uh, reduce the dimensionality of your, 7760 uh, dimensional data set into one, you would still be able to explain 30% of the variance. So it's pretty good. But uh, what we see is, of course, to be a little more uh, convincing, we want to take a top few, right? So here, I don't know how many, I, I take top 50. Okay, so I take the top 50 eigenvectors or the top 50 principal components. So now let's think about this top 50 principal components, right? So essentially what we are doing is, <clears throat> so we have a, we have a matrix X, right? X is something N times 77760, right? And I am going to express it in, and we want, uh, a matrix Z, which is n times 50, all right, which means that every, so n, let's hold that. So this uppercase n is the number of images that we have. Each image is a row in this matrix, and then you want to reduce it into this new matrix in which each row only has 50 elements. So you have reduced the dimensionality, right? And how do we do that? We do that by using a matrix. So we do this transform, right? So Z is just X times W, right? So W is a matrix which has, uh, W is 77760 times 50, right? So these are the top 50 eigenvectors for, uh, so, sorry, not seven. Yeah, that's true. So this is W, right? So if you look at each column in this matrix, right? So this is the 
first principal component. Right? Which means this is the basis vector. This goes back to our discussion 10 minutes back. Is the basis vector which helps you project your data into this one dimensional space. Right? And then the second one would be the second basis vector and so on. So then you get into this 50 dimensional space. So you can look at each principal component. So you can look at the, the values in this and the values in this will tell you something about the data. Right? So each principal component is uh, encoding some information about the data in, within it. Right? So what, what in, the context of, in the context of faces, if we take this data, this vector, right? If, if I convert this into an image, so that image will tell you like some broad property of all the images in this data set, right? So the first principal component in the context of uh, face recognition or face analysis or image analysis, right? If we uh, reshape the first principal component, then it is known as the first eigenface, okay, and then so on, second eigenface, third eigenface. But the idea is, that, I mean, there's nothing new here, all you're, you're giving a name to these eigenvectors because you're doing. So if you look at these top L eigenfaces, right, as I said, we are going to only consider top 50 eigenvectors, then you see that each one of these eigenface is actually uh, the eigenvector, right, but we have reshaped it. It tells you something about the image. So, for example, this first one kind of captures the base property of all the faces. Okay. Second one captures something else. Third one captures more about these uh, hairs, and then fourth, fifth one captures m more properties of slightly longer hairs. There is one eigenface that has more glasses in it, and so on. So each one of them. So essentially, all these fifty eigenvectors are projecting your data. So these are the basis vectors that are putting your data into this new space and each eigenvector tells you some basic property about all this data set, right? So that is the idea. So now the way typically this is used for, so as, I, as you remember, this is all the analysis that was done in this paper back in 1992. Uh, they were using this for face recognition, right? So what you can do now is you can take a new face. This is from the test data set, right? And you can center it. And let's say this is the face, this guy, and uh, you center it, it becomes slightly different. Now you can reconstruct this face so uh, using the eigenvectors, right? And if you remember, if you reconstruct this face using the eigenvectors, principal component and the classic PC, PCA theorem says that using the principal components will give you the best reconstruction. Go ahead. You can use, if you use the first principal component, then essentially you are mapping your data into one dimensional space. So ideally you choose how many to use by looking at this creep plot and trying to identify the need, saying, okay, if I use these many, then it is pretty much giving you most of the information. After that, adding more is not helping you much. So that's kind of how you want to identify that. Then you use those many as to represent this. But in, so what I do here in this, small snippet is that I, I choose first eigenvector, then I choose the first two, then first three and so on, right? And every time I reconstruct my face, okay? So remember, this was my original data, X centered, right? And this is what it looks like. Then I create an X hat. Now, how do we get X hat? Is by first mapping the X centered data into the first L dimensional space, right? So I'm taking, I goes from, so let's say I is one. So first time I'm mapping my data Z, it becomes one dimensional vector, okay? And then I am mapping it back. So I'm recovering the data by multiplying it with W again, right? So this is X hat, okay? So each plot here shows you the recovered image by using top I, eigenvector. So this is using the first eigenvector. So what you see here is that this doesn't resemble this image much, right? 
and the reason being that you are losing so much information but what classical pca theorem says is that this is the best you can get if you project your data in one dimensional space the the best error if you compare if you you know subtract this with this and take the squared sum the pca will give you the lowest value all right then if you take two then this looks like this then as you increase the number of principal components or the number of eigenfaces that you are using you will see that slowly it starts looking like the original space so if you go all the way here right so this is the this is the recovered face that you get by projecting data into 50 dimensional space so you can see that this was the original image and you were able to quite uh, easily get to this now what is the benefit of this so here what you see is that this guy right this this in this photograph he has a different expression right now if you want to do some kind of face recognition so let's say this person comes in the airport right and when they take his photograph he was giving this strange expression right so if you directly compare it to a database of images maybe he won't show up because his image might look different than his you know relaxed image right but when you only take the first few principal components then that effect goes away right because that effect might be in some of the large uh, uh, lower uh, eigen faces right so this would give you a better performance in identifying these kind of images why because it is in some sense removing the noise in your data all right so that is the effect of the principal component so principal components essentially capture some basic properties of your data right so and by only looking at a few you are kind of reducing the eliminating the influence of some of the ran, uh, some of the noisy aspects of your observation all right any questions so far all right so that is the effect of pca Okay, so now let's move on to a new topic today, which is connected. So I'll give you a bit of a background. All right. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. So 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 the idea is this: that uh, that. So after we do the PCA, right? After PCA uh, training, we have a matrix W. We have W, all right? Now W is a D cross L matrix, which means let's say we are embedding it in 50 dimensions, then it will only have that many, right? Then a new data point, data object comes, right? So let's say the new data object is X. Right, and x will be a d cross one vector, right? So then, what I do is I uh, I get represent we represent x in L dimensional space, okay? By uh, by saying z is so let's say that new vector is z, so z is essentially uh, w transpose x. Right, so you're mapping into new space, right? Then we recover x by doing so. We call it x hat. X hat is nothing but uh, w z, right? <clears throat> so what classical PCA theorem says is that x hat minus x. lowest you can get so that is the idea all right but for uh, for doing face detection you using all this uh, the the basic idea is that if you use this as the face now you would get better accuracy in comparing it with other faces in the database all right okay, so let's go back to the new topic right so as i said earlier uh, pca is used uh, now how do you do pca right so what you do with pca is that you compute the covariance matrix of your x and then you compute the eigenvalues right our oh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors but there is another way to do it right another way which comes from this mathematical notion of svd or singular value decomposition i'm assuming that you're familiar with it but i'll still 
uh, I will talk about it a little bit, right? So SVD or singular value decomposition is one class of mathematical uh, concepts uh, known as matrix factorization, right? So if you have a matrix X, if you have a matrix X, you can decompose it into a product of bunch of matrices. So there are many matrix factorization methods available, right? So there's something called Kolesky decomposition, there is COR, there is uh, CR, there's all kinds of decomposition. The idea is that you can, if you take X, you can express it as a product of some individual Xs. So SVD is one of them, right? So what SVD says is, so SVD is singular value decomposition and we'll come to how, why do we call it SVD, right? So, of course, there's a decomposition there. So, we are decomposing X as a product of three matrices, all right? So, if you have a, so in our context, let's say X is a data matrix, that it has N rows and D columns, then you can represent it as a product of U, which is a square matrix, S, which is an N by D diagonal matrix, and V transpose, where V is a D cross D, uh, square matrix, all right? Now, SVD is not, uh, is not a notion in machine learning, right? So, SVD holds for any, any matrix. If I give you any matrix, you can represent it like this, X equal to US V transpose, right? Uh, the reason I have N and D here is because we, we will be talking about it more in the context of data. For us, X is some data matrix. But in general, uh, SVD looks like this, all right? We are assuming that N is greater than D, so which means that this diagonal matrix S, this is not a square matrix, which means that it will only have zeros in the top, right? So I'll show you here. All right. So this is what it looks like in a more illustrative way, right? So let's say this is your data, this is your matrix X. You can decompose it into three uh, as a product of three matrices U, S, and V. Okay, and there is some uh, some constraints on U, S, and V. So, as I said, S will only have uh, diagonal entries, everything else will be zero, right? So, if N is very large, then of course, these, you will have more rows than columns. So, some of the part of S will be all zero because there is no diagonal in a non-square matrix, right? But this is sort of the dominant diagonal on the top. So, only those values will be there. So these values are known as the singular values, okay? So this is a diagonal matrix. This is a matrix U in which each column is orthogonal to each other, okay? So these are known as the left singular vectors, each column in this. V is a square matrix on this side and it will also have all columns as orthogonal to each other. So those are known as the right singular matrix, all right? So what SVD lets you do is the reason it is useful is that if you only choose L columns of U, all right, L entries in S and L entries in V, okay, so you are basically, uh, then the resulting matrix that you get, the new X here, right, will be very similar to the old X, okay, so that is the basic idea. So remember, this is X, right, now you, how many entries do you need to store X, N times D? Right? If I do SVD, then how many entries do I need to uh, store U? Uh, N square plus N times D plus D square, right? Actually, I just need uh, D entries here. So, Right. So, so the idea is this, that if I have some X, which is N cross D, right, then I can decompose it in U, S transpose V, where this is a, so this is a N cross N matrix, this is a, a transpose, uh, D cross D, and this is a N cross D, but this is a diagonal matrix. Okay. Uh, we assume that uh, N is greater than D, all right, which for us holds true because Typically, if this is your data matrix, then these are your objects and these are your features. And in most settings, we have more objects than features. But SVD is general, which means that 
d could be larger than n as well for but here we are going to assume this right which means that if i want to store this matrix i need n d floating points right but if i store it as a as these three and then later sort of uh, combine them then right? then i need n square plus d because there will be only d non zero entries there uh, plus d square entry right so you don't get get much of a benefit there right? but what SVD says is that if I take only the first L vectors and just the L singular values and just the L singular values here, oh sorry, this will be L cross D, then the new X I get will be pretty close to X, right? So it approximates this very well and you can represent this using only NL plus L, L because this is a diagonal matrix remember this is diagonal plus LD alright so suddenly so if L is equal to 1 then X can be stored using N plus 1 plus D entries right Whereas if you had stored it as the original data, you would have stored it using ND entry, right? So that is the benefit of SVD is that it lets you compress your data matrix very well, right? But of course, somebody would say, but what is the guarantee that this X, ha X bar or X tilde is close to X? And that is where the SVD theorem comes in that if I do X minus X this and compute the Frobenius norm of this, will be minimum. So Frobenius norm is nothing but if I give you a matrix, right? Uh, Frobenius norm means you square each entry and sum them all up. So just a sidebar here. So if I have a matrix 2, 3, 4, 1, then the Frobenius norm of this would just be 2 square plus 3 square plus 4 square plus 1 square, right? So that is this. Uh, actually, uh, in square root of that. So what SVD does is that if you represent your data, it ensures that this is the best you would get. So it gives you a good, rep a good compression, right? So that is one benefit of doing SVD, right? Uh, what else? Uh, any questions so far? Yes. All right. So what I'm saying is that let's say I give you a data matrix, okay? The data matrix has 50,000. So let's say uh, n is equal to 50,000 and d is equal to 100, right? And I ask you to store it in your memory, right? So you will need n times d locations. Let's say they are all floating point or whatever, right? So that much memory is what you need, right? W Another thing I can do is that I can decompress it or I can come uh, sorry decompose it using SVD which will give me this right and now instead of storing X I can store these three independently and then when I ask you for X you just multiply it give it to me all right so that way so to store each one of them this one will take 50,000 square because it's n square so 50,000 square plus this one will take because there are only D elements so 100 elements plus 100 square, right? And then when I ask you for X, because you have all these th th three things in your memory, you can reconstruct your X, right? But with SVD, what you can do is that because of this theorem, you can, instead of storing the entire U, you can only store the first L singular vectors, so which will only take N times L. So let's say L is one, that means you just store the first singular vector, which is N, the first singular value which is one number and the first L right singular vectors which are all D so D so now you can store U let's call it U S V and this will take 50,000 values so L is equal to 1 this will do 1 value and 100 values so now in your memory you are only storing these three small things right and then when I ask you for an X I say give me my data matrix back all you do is you just multiply them like this and of course this won't exactly be x because you have 
the, um, approximating it a lot but because of one theorem that we will see quickly this will be the best you could do any other questions all right so let's let's move on all right so this is the idea right so we assume n is greater than d uh, this is the decomposition and then we can represent it by uh, only the l singular values all right now comes the question is what is its relationship to pca all right so that because i motivated svd or at, at least i introduced svd as one way to do pca right so we'll look at that so let's say x is your data matrix all right and x this is the svd or the singular value decomposition of x right so now let us look at the covariance all right so covariance is given by x transpose x there's a 1 over n as well but let's ignore it for now uh, and we are also assuming that our data is centered so there is no x minus mu right so if you if you recall our discussion on covariance right so if i have x typically uh, covariance is given by uh, 1 over n x minus mu trans uh, x minus mu transpose so where mu is the mean right so assuming uh, mu equal to 0 which means that we have already centered our data and ignoring n because that's just a constant for now so then we can rep covariance can be represented covariance of x as x x transpose oh sorry x transpose that's what i'm saying right so that is the idea use this pen However, but x is what? x is u s v transpose, right? We have decomposed it, which means that covariance of x can be written as u s v transpose transpose u s v transpose, all right? Let's bring the transpose inside and this will start looking like uh, um, v because it goes here, s transpose u transpose u s v transpose all right now let's look at this quantity as i said you know svd ensures that each u u is orthogonal i mean each each column in u is orthogonal to each other which means that if you take an orthogonal matrix u and multiply it with its transpose you will get an identity matrix right because you will multiply this row with any other row it will give you 0 if you multiply it with itself it will give you 1 right that's the idea so that means that this can be written as v s t s v transpose right or <clears throat> so let's so what is this right so s is a singular is a diagonal matrix diagonal matrix right which means that d if i say d is s transpose s you're essentially just multiplying the diagonal entries again, right? So this is just another diagonal matrix in which the entries are just a square of the singular values, all right? So let's call this V, D, V transpose, all right? So now, if I take X transpose X, so this is, this is actually X transpose X, right? This is the covariance of X. So now if I take x transpose, so this is x transpose x. So if I multiply v on both sides, right, so this becomes v d v transpose v. And now since this is also the uh, uh, orthogonal matrix, this becomes identity. So this is v d, right, v d, all right. So now let's look at this quantity, right. So this is the, uh, the, the sigma, the covariance matrix. So I'm going to denote it by this, right. And then this is the V and V T, right? So if I take, now this is a diagonal matrix, right? So if I take one row of V, right? So V1, let's say V1 is the first row of V. Then we can write it as this is equal to V1 times the first value in D, which is a constant value, which is a scalar value, which means that this is a, so the solution for this would be the eigenvectors for sigma, right? So this is this looks like that. So which means that each entry in V, right, each column in V is nothing but 
the eigen vector of this sigma so let's not this is not summation this is sigma uh, the covariance matrix all right so which essentially means that is what i wrote here is that the columns of v are the eigen vectors of x transpose x and if you remember the eigen vectors of x transpose x are the principal components for x right which means that if you did svd and looked at the v it would give you the principal components for your data so you so in in pca right so now we have two ways to do pca right so way one so you have some x right so approach one is that you have x you compute x transpose x which is a sigma then you compute the eigen vectors of x transpose x and then the top eigen vector is your top principal component right approach two is you have x and then you compute uh, u s and v which are the singular which is the svd of x and then you just look at the first right singular vector and that is the pc so you you look at the first eigen vector on this side that will be the first principal component and you look at the first right singular vector in v and that will be your principal component so that is the equivalence between pca and svd all right any questions so far right so so the idea is that with pc uh, so if you want to do pca you can do svd but somebody would ask you why do you want to do svd why don't just do pca right and then there are reasons to do that and i'll explain them quickly all right uh, right and another thing is that if you remember right in our calculations the the entries in d are the squared singular values right which means that the square of the singular value will will be the eigen value in the pca context so if you want to now do a scree plot right you don't take the entries of s but you take the square of entries of s and that will give you the eigen eigen values that you can use to determine the knee and everything right so so basically the idea is that if you want to do pca using svd then you can center your x do the svd take the right singular vector and that will give you the principal components all right in fact if you look at any package that does pca they typically use svd to do pca so there is some reason to use svd and i'll quickly explain that all right uh, the reason being that see in this approach right in this approach you have to first compute this covariance matrix and then do a eigen vector decomposition of this sometimes this becomes numerically unstable because you have to do decomposition of this d by d matrix right whereas see, svd often times is more numerically stable so that is reason number 1 second is that if you only need first few principal components then svd has much more efficient ways to compute first few singular vectors right so it's not like if you so if you want to compute the first l singular values then you don't really do the entire svd you just find the first few singular values all right so it's much more efficient to do it that way uh, the third reason is that svd lot of times what happens is your x is sparse sparse means that lot of entries might be zero right but when you compute the the covariance matrix you lose that sparsity because then you have this covariance matrix however with svd there are very efficient implementations to to work with sparse sparse data matrices uh, which are known as sparse svd so there is all kind of benefits that you get by doing svd that you do not get by doing pca hence you use that for that all right so that is the basic idea okay so let's go back to Ooh. right and this i also talked about right so if you uh, so this is what the benefit of svd from the other aspect is so there are two benefits of svd first is if you do svd you can do pca very efficiently second is what i was talking earlier is that you can use svd to compress your data right so as i said right you can represent an n times d matrix 
using only a few eigenvectors, a few singular vectors, and this would give you the best approximation. Okay? So there is a theorem called eckert young mirsky theorem which says that if you only use the L singular vectors and L singular values and you reconstruct your data matrix using this like this. So only using the L left singular vectors, L singular values and L right singular vectors, then the, the error that you get is the minima. It's called eckert young mirsky theorem. Right? So now you have a way of, so, so you can do SVD to do PCA, you can do SVD to, uh, to compress your data. And then there are other benefits as well. Right? We talked about this as well. Uh, yeah, so there's all these things. I think my slides are not in a very good order, so I need to rearrange them. But what this tells you is that, remember uh, in PCA we do, do this, uh, you know, mapping into this Z space, right? And then when you come back into the X space, when you reconstruct your data, that is nothing but doing this, USV, right? So uh, uh, they are equivalent, basically, right? So as I said, the benefits of SVD is that, of course, it gives you a faster and a more stable way to do PCA. But there are other applications as well. You can do image compression, like I showed you. You can also do use it for recommender systems. I'll give you an example. And then there are other as uh, other applications like topic modeling and uh, these are more advanced topics within machine learning, something called latent, latent semantic indexing and so on. So these are all good benefits of SVD. So it's a pretty interesting method, all right? So let me give you a quick demo of how to use it for one thing, then we'll come, come back to other things later on, right? So let's talk about image compression, right? So as I said, SVD lets you compress data, okay? So in this case, we are going to load an image, okay? So this is my image that we are going to look at. So this is my X, okay? So, so far in, a, in your assignments, we were, we were looking at a collection of images, right? So we're looking at your X, each row was an image. But here we are going to assume that we only have one image, X, okay? So X has these many rows and these many columns, okay? And I've converted into black and white. I wanted to work with black and white converted it into a numpy array. So this is what it looks like. Now we want to use SVD to compress it. So this is our X, okay? So what you can do is you can use the linear algebra package within numpy to do your U, S, and V. And then let's say I only take the first singular value, the first singular vector, first singular value, and first right singular vector and reconstruct my X, okay? So this is what I get. Of course, it doesn't mean much because you're losing a lot of information, but you see a general, uh, you know, behavior correspondence between this and this, right? So there are some dark areas, there are some light areas, right? And what the Eckert Minsky Young theorem says is that if you compute the error between this image and this image, that will be the least. If you do anything else, you cannot do better than SVD, all right? Now, but we want to see, okay, what happens if you take more singular vectors? So I'm going to do it in a loop. So I'm going to choose more eigenvector, more singular vector. So this is an image that you reconstruct. If you take the first five singular values, singular vectors, starts looking like the original one, first 10, first 15, and so on. And this is what you get when you use only the first 50 singular values, right? So this looks very much like your original data, right? Even though you are only using the first 50 singular values. So remember, your x, right? Your x is actually, uh, your original data is around 2, you know, 2000 by 2000 or even more than that, right? But by doing SVD, you are only representing it using 2000 by 50 singular values, right? So you can get a very good compression and without losing too much of information. And, you know, Eckert Minsky Young theorem says is that this is the best you can get in terms of compression. All right. So we'll talk more about it next time. Uh, any questions so far? I have a couple of announcements. So one thing is the assignment is due on Friday, right? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not here on Friday. I have to go somewhere in the morning. So my student, uh, my PhD student is going to take the lecture on Friday. He's going to talk about uh, generative models for graphs. So, so far we have been looking at you know, data in uh, d-dimensional space and so on. But what if your data objects are graphs, right? So a lot of the 
things that you have learned here would apply there as well. So he's been doing his research in those, those areas. So those are very interesting areas if you're doing things like social network analysis or uh, uh, graph uh, network modeling and things like that. So it'll be very interesting. Please uh, try to attend. But I do want to make clear that that is not going to be covered in the final exam, right? So that's just an extra topic that uh, would be beneficial for you. And then we will resume all of this discussion on Monday. So Monday, my, uh, my aim will be to cover everything that I want to cover in this course by Monday. And then we'll dedicate Wednesday and Friday for doing more of a course review. All right. Uh, any other questions? Yes. May 11th. I think so. Yeah. I don't know if it's a Monday or not, but it's May 11th. <laughs> don't, is it Monday? It's a Wednesday. It's a Wednesday. It's here. I have, I have it on the thing, right? So, uh, all right. Thank you very much.